Good morning and welcome to worship. My name is Pastor Liz and I'm one of the pastors here at Oceanside First Presbyterian Church. And friends, I wanna let you know that each and every one of you have been called today to be in relationship with Jesus Christ, to draw deeper to him and to grow in your faith. And we're grateful that Oceanside Press can be a part of that journey. And so I want to invite you to part of that journey as we worship today, as we listen to God's word, as we sing God's praises. So as you are welcome to worship, would you please be open to what God would have you to do today? And we promise we'll do the same. Well, friends, there's a couple things I want you to know about. Number one is that today in person at 1130 is our new members class. Uh, it is the first of two weeks of our new members class. It will be this week and then the first week in December. It's a great time to get to know the congregation a little bit better, to explore what it means to be Presbyterian, that really long word. What does that even mean? To... Uh, see how God is moving specifically in this place, and to see if this is where God is calling you to join the community. So we'd love for as many of you uh, to be there as possible. Number two, today is our spirit of Christmas fair. It is one of my favorite days of the year. I say that a lot about a lot of things, but this is one of my favorite days of the year. And the reason why is that we get the opportunity to meet with our mission partners, to meet them and get to know them and get to know those ministries that we partner with. Ministries like Solutions for Change and Brother Benno's. Us. Our missionaries from Turkey, Aaron and Andy Hoyles are gonna be here with their sweet little baby, Zicky. Um, and a number of other people are gonna be at the Spirit of Christmas Fair. It's also a really great opportunity to give in this Christmas season. Uh, you can get a little ornament from the tree and uh, sponsor our Marine Family Christmas, which is our uh, E5 and below Marines who are serving this country and don't have a lot of spare cash to buy their kids, their kids and their spouses Christmas gifts. And it's a great way that we can show the love of Christ for them in this Christmas season. If you don't are not able to come in person, but you still want to participate, you can go to the you can go to Amazon and you can find our wish list at Spirit of Christmas Fair uh, 2021. If you need more information about that, you can call the church office and we'll get you hooked up with that. Well, friends, we are glad that you're here and we are so grateful for each and every one of you. So let's worship God together. We. Mm -hmm. 
into this time of confession, the thing that keeps coming to my heart and the thing that the Spirit is doing in my own life is calling me to remember that I am not a litany of the bad things that I've done. But rather, I am a beloved child of God. And just like we go to our spouses or our kids or our friends when we make mistakes, we ask for forgiveness. And so God is really asking us to do likewise. It's not because God doesn't love us when we make mistakes. In fact, God loves us in spite of our mistakes. God sent his son in spite of our sin. And so as we confess today, I invite you not to go before God with a litany of, oh, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, but a litany of, I'm sorry. I want to make this right so that we can move forward. Would you pray with me? God of mercy, you command us to love one another across all differences, and you open us to new horizons. Yet we often respond with fear and judgment that hinders your goal for humanity. Forgive our sins, we pray and give us a true repentance that leads us to a life for all creation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hear and believe the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are all forgiven. The slate is wiped clean. Thanks be to God. Casting my cares aside, I'm leaving my past behind. I'm setting my heart and mind on you, Jesus. I'm reaching my hand to yours, believing there's so much more.
Take two. I want to ask you a question. How have you felt Christ's love demonstrated in your life? Take an opportunity to respond in your comment section below saying how you have felt Christ's love demonstrated in your life. And when you think about the ways in which you have felt Christ's love demonstrated, also think about how you too demonstrate Christ's love. Because I think that we do it in the ways in which we live and move and have our being. We do it in the money that we give. We do it through how we spend our time. We do it through how we share the gifts of, and talents that God has given us with the world. And so as we give this morning, I would love if you gave, not out of compulsion or because you feel like you have to, but because you are doing it because of the way in which Christ's love has been demonstrated in your life and you would like to do likewise. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that every day you give us an opportunity to demonstrate your love, to show your grace, to live out your mercy. And God, we pray that each and every one of us would seek your face, seek your desire and your will for our lives, and that each and every one of us would give as you call us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Good morning and welcome back to Oceanside First Presbyterian Church. My name is Mike Colleen. I'm the lead pastor here and I'm so thankful that you've decided to worship with us today. Uh, today we're continuing our series called Remedy for a Broken World. Um, over the last three weeks we've been looking at the the key issues or the core issues where we think that the, the world's a little bit broken and we've kind of realize that we don't have to look very far to see, well, where the world is broken. I mean, uh, you just look outside your window and you can see some of the brokenness. Um, uh, for some, we encounter brokenness when we're at work. For some, we encounter brokenness when we're in our neighborhood. For others, we find brokenness when we're with our families. All you got to do is turn on the TV lately and you experience a ton of brokenness. But there's another brokenness that lives well deep inside each of us so we encounter that brokenness when we well, look in the mirror and that's one of the hardest parts of the bro of of our brokenness that we have to deal with and, and and when we started talking about this brokenness we realized excuse me that there are three areas that we're trying to find the remedy to and we found the answer to two of these and the the first area is in identity right who am i and our answer to that is we are a child of God. We are who God says we are. The, the second area that we were looking for a remedy for was for belonging. And belonging is we, we, we want to make sure that everybody knows, well, where they belong. And it's not like you, we're, we're putting you in a place, but you are invited to a place. You're invited to a place where, where everybody knows your name, where you can be the best version of who you are. Um, and today we're digging into the last of those three core issues that we think have been affected by the brokenness, which is our purpose. What am I here for? What am I here for? And, and, and I believe that we're called to be here to demonstrate God's love, to demonstrate God's love to, to, to this very, very broken world. Now, I remember uh, struggling over this question of purpose as a, as a younger man in my life. I remember before going to college, uh, I was trying to figure out what my major was going to be and as if, as if my major was going to define who I am and define my purpose in this life. I remember struggling again with, well, what is my purpose right before I became a father for the first time? Because everything began to change. The world seemed to be crazy and chaotic. And one more time before I took my first call, what is my purpose? What, who am I supposed to be? How, how am I supposed to live this out? Is this significant, this thing that I'm going to be doing? So in my time in working with students, I've seen maybe 30 different graduating classes. Actually, more than that from uh, uh, different schools. And I stopped asking the question, well, what's going to be your major? What's your major when you graduate? What are you going to be studying when you go to college? I, I realized that that is possibly the, the worst question you can ask someone that's graduating. <clears throat> And so I changed the question to make it have significance, to make it have meaning. And I ask students this question all the time, and I ask you this question as well. What problem in the world are you going to fix? Right? What problem in the world do you feel called to step into and add your skill and your talent and your energy and your heart? What problem in the world are you going to fix? Because Different questions bring about different answers, right? And those different answers will actually lead us to better actions. I believe most people are asking, well, not what my purpose in life is, but what can I do with my life that's actually going to be important? What can I do that's going to be important? And finding the answer to that question, well, the finding the answer to that question changes everything. So what are we going to do in our life that's important? How are we supposed to demonstrate God's love to a broken world? Well, Jesus gives us guidance on this, thankfully. Uh, he actually has a conversation about purpose and meaning when he's in the upper room with, uh, with, his, with his disciples on the night before he's be, about to be betrayed. He actually tells his disciples, he gives them a command, right? He tells them this is how it's going to be. And he tells them this right after Judas leaves, right after Judas gets up and realizes he's going to be the one that betrays Jesus. He says this, Jesus says this, this one command I give you, to love one another. To love one another. That's, that's the big command. It's in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Why don't you open your Bibles and read it along with me? John 13, 34. A new command, or you could even say purpose, I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must 
love one another. By this, this loving of one another, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Wow. Jesus knows what's coming for his disciples. Jesus knows what the next few days are going to hold. He knows what the next few weeks are going to hold. He knows what the next few years and decades and even centuries are going to hold for the people that follow after Christ. And what I think is really interesting is that this is not one of the things that most followers of Jesus hold on to, this idea that we are called to love one another. Most of us really like fighting with each other. We like struggling with each other. We like uh, pointing out the small distinctions and differences in what we believe, and, and, and we'll, we'll fight to the death for those things. But Jesus says, love one another. Hmm. He, he kind of says that this is your, your, your overriding goal. This is the one goal I don't want you to forget. This is your prime directive. Love one another the same way that I have loved you. Because if we love each other, we are going to show the world a kind of love that it's unfamiliar with. A kind of love that literally changes the world. A kind of love that takes the brokenness and points it to a place where it can be healed, where it can be restored, where even it can be resuscitated. You know, Jesus give this, gives this command to his disciples before things got complicated. Because, you know, right after they leave the room, right after they, they go to the garden, things begin to get complicated. And, and it reminds me of, uh, of an opportunity I had when I was a, a younger man and I had this opportunity to... Um, I was house-sitting for my friend, and my friend Bernie, uh, they had like two dogs, a cat, and a hamster, and they had this huge garden. And so when I met with the family, Claire, Marie Claire said, whatever happens, don't forget to water the garden. Whatever happens, don't forget to water the garden. I think she told that to me like five times now that I think about it. It was like the first instruction she gave. She was the middle instruction she gave. And then she emphasized it again and again and again at the end. And so when I would go over, I would remember to take care of the dog and the cats and, and the hamsters. But I have to be honest, for that first week, I totally forgot about the garden. I completely, completely forgot about the garden. And so when I came back on like the beginning of the second week, I looked at the garden and the garden was like dying. It was all shriveling up and the corn wasn't looking good. The, none of the, the, the vegetables were looking any good. And so I came back like twice a week, I mean twice a day, adding some water, bringing some water, bringing some water, so that there's just a chance that when they got back, it would, be, it would still be there because I had forgotten the key thing that they told me to take care of, which was don't forget to water the plants. Jesus is telling his disciples, don't forget to love one another the same way that I have loved you. Jesus was emphasizing this idea that one of the ways we bring healing to this broken world is by loving one another. So the mark of a, of a follower of Christ it, it is not judgment, but it's loving one another. The mark of a follower of Christ is not in how we correct one another, it's, no, it's in how we love one another. The mark of a Christian, someone that's following after Jesus, is not in their rule following or their religiosity. No, it's in how they love one another. Jesus' brother James, his little brother James, approached the same concept, the same topic of how do I demonstrate God's love to this broken world, but he did it from a different angle, as most little brothers do, right? They always look at things from of a different angle. So I want you to turn to your Bibles to James chapter 1, uh, verse 26. James 1, 26. And it says this, Those who consider themselves religious and yet, not, and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. The first thing that James gives us here is we have to be in control of the words that come out of our mouths. Um, we cannot find ourselves or our words leading us into conflict or fight, um, especially leading us away from love. He says, if we do those things, if we're, if we're constantly arguing, constantly fighting, constantly saying things that tear each other down, well, that means our religion is worthless. What we're doing, what we're practicing is worthless. How you talk about people has a spiritual impact. How you speak impacts who you are and how you're going to be able to reach the world, how you're going to be able to demonstrate that love. If, if people think that every word that comes out of your mouth is going to be poison, they're not going to want to come and hang out with you. They're not going to come and want to know about the love that you know. If I said, 
you know, I hate preschoolers, right? I think preschool kids are the worst. They're, they're smelly. They, their nose is always crusty. I just hate them, hate them, hate them, right? If I said that. And then I went and applied for a job as a preschool teacher. Well, my words are going to get me in trouble. Um, Jesus, excuse me, James takes this idea of loving one another and he wants to put it into real action, right? He wants to put it into real action. He, the words that you're going to say are going to affect the outcome. So think about the words that you say and how you say them, who you say them to. Do you have a tight rein on, on, on those lips, right? Can you control what you say? James says it's important because it shows how we love one another. And, but he continues on. He says, the religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. To James, loving God looks like caring for those who are lost in the margins, caring for those that have fallen through the gaps of our culture, caring for those that get lost. But he continues on and he adds this line. He says, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. To keep oneself from being polluted by the world. It's, it's as if he's saying, you've got to go do these things and love these people and care for the world, this broken world, but don't get um, stained by it. Remember how God's love is redemptive, how it's restorative, how it's even rusts, uh, how it can bring back people from the dead. Right? It, it's uh, resuscitative. I can't even say the word, but that's, you know what I'm trying to say. It's resuscitative. Resuscitative. I can't say it. <laughs> So I want to help you today get practical with how you bring a remedy to this broken world, right? So I want to help you get practical in your response and how you're called to demonstrate God's love to a broken world. The first thing I want to encourage you to do is to pray. I know that seems trite, but when we talk about praying, I want you to pray uh, not only for the broken situation that you're looking at, the broken parts of our world that, that you encounter, but I would ask that you pray that God would utilize you in the solution. Always be praying toward the solution and not just into the problem. God, use me. God, use me. Look past the problem and pray for the solution and pray that God would put you into that solution. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-4 through 4 says this, I urge you then, first of all, uh, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For, the, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. He invites us to pray for everyone, from our friend to our foe, to our politician, to our, to our king, to all those in authority. And what I think is interesting is that in, the, in this passage, he says that we're to live peaceful and quiet lives. Uh, there's a movement afoot in many churches right now that's, that's calling people into to drastic action. But that seems to stand in direct opposition to what we're reading here. This is good and pleases God when we, are, when we live peaceful and quiet lives. Um, And God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. The second thing I want you to consider doing as you're seeking to bring a remedy to our broken world is to listen. Actually, to listen better. Let me say that again for those who weren't listening. I want you to listen better. I want you to listen with love. Listen with the same ears that God listens to your prayer request with. Listen with an attitude that says, tell me more. Listen not waiting to speak your turn, but listen to understand uh, the issues of the people around you, um, whether they come from the same standpoint as you or a wildly different standpoint. You listen better. James 1.19 says this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. If we were quick to listen, it's easy for the other two to come become very, very slow. 
The last thing I have to encourage you to do is, well, actually to become encouragers, to, to lean into this, the, to the gap of our world where there is an encouragement gap, where there is a hope gap, where there is a, a promise gap. Where there is darkness, we're supposed to bring light. Where there's hopelessness, we're supposed to, to bring hope. Where there is illness, we, br- we, we, we bring healing, right? Um, we as followers of Christ are compelled by the hope that's within us to share it with the world, to pour it out on those who have yet to experience it. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, Encourage one another all the more and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. We're, we're called to be people that encourage Uh, Imagine that if every time you met a Christian, a met a follower of Christ, that they made you feel better. They they pointed you to a better story, a bigger story, a story of hope and promise, instead of pain and derision and separation and and division. Hmm. That might be one of the greatest cures to the broken world we've experienced. And so we live to be the remedy to, for this broken world. We know that it all comes through Christ, but Christ invites us to, to, to work alongside him. And so the first way we do that is by understanding our identity. Well, it comes from Christ. And, and we get to help other people discover their identity in Christ. We are all who God says we are. And scripture calls us his children. Uh, the second way we live into to being part of the, of the remedy of, for our broken world is by finding our belonging in God. By finding our belonging literally in the family of God as we are adopted into this family, where where we can be the best version of ourselves, where, where we can literally be where everybody knows your name. And the last thing, the last thing we do is we find our I our purpose by remembering that we're called to change the world through an act of demonstration, an act of loving one another with the same kind of love that God has shown you and shown me. Um, And and the world doesn't understand this kind of uh, unconditional self-sacrificing love, and I don't expect it to, but I do know that it changes the world every time the world encounters it. It's changed me and it's changed you. So I want to invite you to say these three core truths with me. I always start by God's love for you is true. But the, the, the three are this. Say them with me. They're on screen. I am created to pursue an authentic relationship with my creator. I belong to Jesus Christ and I define who I am by what he says. And I exist every day to demonstrate God's love to a broken world. So I want to invite you to go do those things. Let's go and do those things. Let's be those kind of people. Let's bring the remedy to the broke. Let's bring our remedy to this broken world. Amen. Amen.